So uh, given that many of you seem to be on the social end of the spectrum in terms of what you study, I thought that I would look at some of the more sociological aspects of the work um, that I do. Specifically, we look at access to information, uh, freedom of information, the commodification of information, and knowledge in particular, and understanding. Um, this, this was born out of a desire to try to bring access to medications that were already on the shelf. There are many ailments which plague the world for which we have solutions. And yet, those solutions are not accessible to most of the people who acquire them. So um, just briefly about me, um, if you've seen me before, I spoke, I've spoken at many conferences. This was Hope, where I manufactured Daraprim. Daraprim's active pharmaceutical ingredient is pyrimethamine. Pyrimethamine is the only known solution for toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is a parasite. It's not dangerous. Most of us in this room probably have it, at least I do. Um, it's not dangerous unless you have a compromised immune system, advanced stages of cancer, HIV, or pregnancy. But in those cases, it's extraordinarily dangerous, and access to Daraprim is extraordinarily important. Um, Daraprim was $13.50 per pill. Um, and then it was purchased by Turing Pharmaceuticals, which was run by Martin Shkreli, if you've heard of him. He then changed the price on those same pills at 50 milligrams a piece from $13.50 to $750 a piece. And this was not seen as very humanitarian. Um, so uh, I got some press attention because manufacturing it on stage, and I threw pills to the crowd. Um, this was him about a week uh, beforehand when he was arrested for insider trading. I also made a stink because I, I hacked his cell phone and I called it from stage. Um, and if you'd like to do that, um, <laughs> feel free. <clears throat> um, he was more polite than you might think. Then we got a bit more press attention because Mylan had the EpiPen. This is the adrenaline injection for people who are, have uh, <clears throat> reactions of, uh, uh, um, what's, what's the word? Thank you. Yeah. Or, or asthmatics. Um, and again, these were fairly accessible. They were single use items though. You couldn't test them. Um, they were still, you know, closed source and under patent, we found a way to utilize an off-the-shelf auto-injector that's used for diabetics who are needle phobic. Um, and we distributed uh, some instructions on how to use this along with off-the-shelf needles and um, syringes. And you can download instructions and this cute little sticker that you can put on. And the other thing about this is that it's reusable. So unlike the EpiPen, which is a single-use item, our version of the EpiPen, so you can reload multiple times. It's a single investment of $30 instead of $600. And when you reload, it only costs you $3. <clears throat> um, on top of that, shortly after we released this, 81,000 EpiPens were recalled because they were failing. And the danger with that is that you don't know if you have a faulty one until you use it. So again, I want to talk a little bit more about the human rights aspect of this, more specifically. Um, I geared my talk, uh, the, the graffiti in Cuba is beautiful, and I love it. So I tried to sort of theme my talk around graffiti. Um, so when we talk about human rights, we have to ask what makes a human right essential? What makes a right human? What makes us human? And what makes us human is the human body and the human mind. And so the first human right that we should all have is to be able to adjust our bodies and to adjust our minds in any way we see fit. So two things come out of that. The first thing is that we should be able to manage our own health, however we see fit. 
We should not be held back by barriers of legality or of price or of lack of infrastructure, but oftentimes these are the things that keep us from having access to medications. In addition, we should be able to explore scientifically and expand the mind. In the past, there have been a number of times historically when morality and economics have come to a head. We saw it in Europe during the Reformation. We saw it worldwide during the Cold War. In the United States, we saw it during slavery. And what occurred was, you saw a time when there was a group of people who said, what is occurring is immoral and it has to stop. And the established group said, we understand that it's immoral and we don't like it either, but this is the way our economy works and so it has to stay. And then another group came back and said, that's not good enough. The example of the United States and slavery is a classic example. People cannot be property. We understand, but that's how our economy was built. That's not good enough. And currently, we're undergoing a similar transformation worldwide. There are people who are saying, ideas can't be property. They belong to all of humanity. These are the things that enrich our lives. And this is something that I think is shared here amongst some of you at least. The idea that opening up human knowledge, opening up technology, making things more available, sharing information, and not keeping things this closed is better. Now, I know I'll diverge philosophically from some of you at this juncture because I know that many of you work very hard within the structures which exist. And I want to be very clear that I respect that a great deal. And I think that's very important work, even though it's not the work I do. There's a very important thing of which to be aware of the importance of coalition between liberal movements and radical movements. Liberal movements are permanent or quasi-permanent when you enact a law, when you change policy, when you create an institution, but they're slow to start. Radical movements are very short-lived. They're not permanent solutions. They're quick fixes, but they get off the line quickly. And that's what we're trying to do. So one of the things that we think about a great deal is trying to keep intellectual property from being shrouded. How do you take that information and make it so that people can use it? Now again, the morality issue comes into play. There are a lot of questions and there's a lot of rhetoric surrounding intellectual property and the way it works saying it's an important facet of our economy. This is the way things work. If you start manufacturing medications that are under patent, what's to keep the pharmaceutical industry functioning? And isn't that an act of theft? Now, putting to the side for a moment that question as to whether you believe that's an act of theft, if you do believe that that act of theft to manufacture medication that is under patent is actually indeed an act of theft, then withholding medication that exists, that exists from people who need it and are dying is an act of murder. And so to perpetrate an act of theft to prevent an act of murder I think is really easy to argue. In fact, I would call it a moral imperative. And worse than that, when we stand by and we allow it to happen and we don't save those people, all of us are part of the problem. Every moment that goes by. And I've been speaking for three minutes. In the last three minutes, nine people have died from HIV. Three people have died from hepatitis. There have been over 33 botched abortions which may result in fatalities, some of them. And there have been uh, over 40 drug overdoses resulting in death. And we've done nothing because the information that allows people to manufacture the medications which would save them, these are all preventable things, treatable things, curable in three out of the four cases, we're complicit. So, how do you fix this? 
You fix this the same way that everything gets fixed. You just start working. And just like anything else, you get in there and you muck around and you start doing it. So, we're conditioned to think about the manufacture of medication as though it happens in heaven. The pills fall from the sky and they're made in some special secret zone in some, in some uh, factory somewhere far away where everything is perfect. But the truth is, every single medication that you've ever taken, it started out being made by one person in a laboratory. And yes, they may have had a little more education in, in chemistry or medicine than most of us. And yeah, they may have had a few specialized techniques and tools, but everything started with somebody who was just mucking around. That's how everything starts. And the beauty, the real beauty of science is that it's reproducible. That's why it's called science. And so we have the power that if somebody has done something somewhere, if it is a solved problem, you can solve it yourself. And that's one of the things that we saw that was so powerful in the open software movement. The ability for people to say, oh, somebody's done this? Well, I can do it. Because the conditions are the same. And conditions don't have to be very different when you're making things that are a little more concrete. Now, one of the things that I'm often asked first at the end of talks is, isn't this dangerous? Aren't people going to make drugs? Aren't people going to make it incorrectly and poison themselves? Aren't people going to start making poison and, or explosives or whatever else? That's not what I'm afraid of. What I'm afraid of is what's already happening, which is the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who die every day and they are not treated despite the fact that we have technology on the shelf that can save them. It's already a problem. That's a problem. That scares me. Now, not to say that chemistry can't be a little touchy sometimes, and I'd like to take a moment to just mention a specific example. I'm not sure how legible this is, but this is a book that was written by a friend of mine called The Case of the Frozen Addicts, and this happened in California, and there was a uh, a guy who was manufacturing an opioid uh, for drug use. I think intravenous, yeah, intravenous drug use. It's, it's like heroin, but it's more potent. And he made a mistake. And there was a side reaction. And there was a poison in it. And overnight, something like 20 drug addicts became, like went into advanced stages of Parkinsonism. They were, they were frozen, they, couldn't, they were conscious, but their bodies couldn't move. And it was horrific and nobody could figure out what was going on until they had to trace this back and it took months. And it was extraordinarily tragic. Now why did that happen? Many people argue, oh well, the guy went to the public library and he read a little bit and he understood some things, but you know, and that's the danger. We need to keep this information for people who study. That is not correct. That is not correct. What caused this was that part of the studies that he had read had been cut out specifically to keep people from manufacturing these drugs. And so the information he had was not complete. And because of that, he made poison. So it's very important to remember that the dissemination of information is a solution and not a problem. We need to disseminate more information. We need to s disseminate better information. We need to be more vigilant about it. Again, you also have to ask the question, if you're about to die and you're manufacturing your own medication because you can't get it otherwise, what exactly is going to be worse? You're going to die. You can wait or you can do anything. I mean, sing a song, you know, do a little dance. It doesn't matter. Anything is better than waiting and saying, the system says that I can't afford it, so I'm not allowed to have it. The system says that this is illegal, and I'm not allowed to have it. 
I can't get it because there aren't systems to import the things that I need. So I'll just wait and die and, you know, okay. No, it's not okay. Again, the most basic human right. You should be able to save your own life. And again, the logic is really poor. This is the same thing that people say, oh, you know, vaccinations might be dangerous. Really? Okay. Are they more dangerous than not having them? It's the same thing as saying, oh, I'm going to swim through this bridge, you know, swim through this river that has these, these, these toxic laser eels um, instead of going over the bridge because the bridge might not be safe because I didn't test it. I don't know. bridge might not be safe, so I'm going to swim. Bad logic. Again, and it's the same as, as, as when there are places, there are institutions that say, oh, we're not giving out birth control, so, so don't have sex. Bad, bad idea. <laughs> so again, let me get back to the specifics here. Drug overdose, botched abortions. This is hepatitis C, and this you can see is, is HIV. There are solutions to all of these. This is Sovaldi, Uh This molecule is new. It's extremely powerful. Usually when you have a virus, it stays in your body forever. You get a cold, it stays. You get herpes, it stays. You get hepatitis C, usually it stays. This new technology will actually eradicate the virus from your body entirely. You don't have to manage it for the rest of your life. You take one pill of this for 12 weeks and it's gone forever, okay? The problem is this is under patent and so they can charge whatever they want. And these pills are 1,000 US dollars a piece. So if you have 82,000 US dollars burning a hole in your pocket then Hepatitis C is not your problem, but for the rest of us, still a problem. These two molecules, this is mifepristone and misoprostol. Now this isn't a problem in Cuba. It's not a problem in, in most civilized countries in the world. This is the, abort the abortion pill. It actually is two pills. Um, this one, uh, is, uh, I, I, I'll skip the tech, technical pieces. One is an emagogue, will actually cause expulsion of the uterus. The other one is a, is a hormonal blocker. And these two taken in conjunction with one another correctly within the first three months of pregnancy are a safe form of abortion in 95 to 97% of cases. Now here's the interesting thing. Where I currently live in the United States, this is unavailable, totally unavailable um, through legal channels, okay? And yet, down the street from the house where I live here, I can get this over the counter for a few peso. Like, no big deal. Interestingly, we're in a more civilized country than los Estados Unidos. Um, and I think it's very funny that I come here to Cuba where the theme of the country is how do you do more with less? To talk about doing more with less to solve a problem that Los Cubanos don't have. <laughs> you guys have a beautiful system of health in many cases. And yet, in the richest country in the world, people can't get medication. It's very bizarre. This is uh, Naloxone. It's marketed under the trade name Narcan. This will reverse opioid overdose. You, you inject too much heroin, you smoke too much opium, you take a bunch of pills. This will immediately reverse that process and it will take you out of it. Um, it used to be that it had to be injectable. It's even more powerful now. You can, you can take it in a uh, uh, in, in, in sufflate. In sufflate? You. <laughs> Right? You, can, you, you, you breathe in like, like an inhaler, like an asthma inhaler. Okay. Um, this is becoming more available in the U.S. Finally, finally. Again, in the U.S., not a civilized country. Right? We hate drug addicts. They're bad people. Um, <clears throat> but now this is becoming over-the-counter in, in many states. It's available in Oregon and New York. 
and California and a few others. And this is the last one. This is GSK744. Um, it's going to be marketed under the trade name Cabotegravir. This is an antiretroviral. It's a treatment for HIV. HIV treatment is very difficult. You usually have to take three drugs. You have to take them at specific times of the day. You have to make sure that they're at the exact same time every day. You have to time it very carefully. This, when put in a nanoparticle suspension and injected intramuscularly, 800 milligrams, um, and injected 800 milligrams, will suppress your viral load below detectable for four months. You can have this medicine four times a year, and your viral load will stay below detectable. And if you do not have HIV, it will keep you from contracting it. This is extraordinarily powerful technology because it means if you go into a community that has a very high viral load, you don't have to test. The stigma of testing is one of the most difficult things to deal with when managing health crisis in HIV. You go and you say, we know people are sick and we don't care who. We're going to give this to everybody and we'll be back next season. Now, something I want to specify. My group, the technology, nothing we're creating. We're not, uh, we're, not, we're not inventing anything. We're not creating anything new. All this technology is on the shelf. And the barrier, of course, when you say manufacture your own medicine, is that people are afraid of science. People are afraid of chemistry. People are afraid of, of, of uh, science of medicine. But if we think for a moment, in the 80s, everybody was afraid of computers. Now we all have one in our pocket, we got one on the desk, we have one on our lap. 10 years ago, rapid prototyping, that was a specialty thing that was in a few niche industries. And today, 3D printing is something that we all say. Everybody knows it. What changed? Two things. A little bit of automation and a good user interface. And that's all it takes. So how do you automate chemistry? Well, you totally can. It's already done. These exist. If you go into a fancy laboratory like at MIT or Harvard or, or Stanford, any fancy lab has these. These are automated chemical reactors. Because most of the time you spend working in chemistry, you're babysitting a beaker. You have a, you have a graduate student do it, right? But it's really boring work. You have to maintain temperature, you need to stir, you need to inject reagents at particular times, then you read a really thick book, right? It's boring, it's boring. So there are these systems. <clears throat> There's a little USB slot here. You put the key in, you load a file, you load the reagents into these chambers, you say go, and you go home. You come back in the morning, and it's done. Now the thing is, these are very expensive, thousands of dollars. You can't buy them if you're a citizen. You have to have a laboratory. And they're full of proprietary technology. Everything on there is patented. But what it does, it's not terribly sophisticated. It injects reagents at particular times. It regulates temperature. You can see there's one, one glass you know, within another glass. And it circulates a, a fluid to keep the temperature regulated. And it stirs. There's a little stir bar here. That's about it. Sometimes if you're doing a specialty reaction, you need, need an, an extra sensor to measure pH or to regulate pressure, but rarely. So I thought, I can do that. <laughs> so I did. And this is the first generation reactor. <clears throat> As you can see, this is the top of a jar like this. That's it. This is just a mason jar. It's just glass, because glass is chemically non-reactive. Here you can see, this is the nipple from a bicycle tube to regulate pressure. Here I have a, a tea warmer to heat. There's a, this you can see is a thermocouple. And these two tubes are just a, a pump. It's out of a fish tank. And that was all it took. This was the very first generation of the reactor. It was a very simple unit. I made aspirin. I took it. I'm still OK. My headache's gone. <laughs> 
So here's some other pictures, right? You can see the top again, and here you can see the T-warmer and the thermocouple and the tubes. And this was the first generation of the uh, syringe pump. This was not our invention. There was a, a, a woman in España who, who developed this system. And you can see a new version of it here, where you 3D print these parts, and there's a stepper motor that runs, and it depresses this pump, and it will inject a reagent via a tube. So here was the second generation, where we were building in some automation. This is an Arduino Uno. And um, these are capac uh, uh, relay, relay banks. One of them controlled the heating element, turned it on and off. One of them uh, turned the motor for stirring. And, um, and the other one was for the pump. Here, so this, this again is the alpha unit. You can see this is, a, this is a pneumatic pump for tires to regulate pressure. Uh, this was a PID unit that just takes input from the thermocouple and turns the heating unit on and off. And again, here are the syringe pumps. Later, a fellow joined us who was a, uh, a 3D printing specialist. Now, we didn't want to do 3D printing because access to a 3D printer is, is not very easy. But as it became more widespread, and there are services that you can send a file to over the internet, and they will mail you the part, we thought, this clearly solves more problems than it creates. And so you can see, this, is, this was sort of the early edition of the beta unit. And you can see it's a jacketed reactor. There's a glass jar inside another glass jar. And you pump fluid inside the outer glass jar. And the reaction takes place inside the inner glass jar. This was uh, the breakout board uh, built out of a Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, again, chosen because it's very cheap, it's very easy to get, it's very easy to program. Um, everything's you know, simple and open source. It's developed, I'll, sh I'll show you the latest unit. So um, here's a picture of me in, in my house. <laughs> so I was so happy to get it. So this is, this is the unit that you're looking at. Um, here's the outer jar, and here's the inner jar. And you, as you can see, this is a, a stirring bar. It's covered in Teflon, so it's chemically non-reactive. Oh, I should also say, this particular plastic is some plastic that's chemically low reactive. So you don't have to worry about it unless you're dealing with something horribly toxic, maybe. But it doesn't melt. It's very strong. Um, these two connections circulate fluid. And so here, this pumps out into a secondary unit that does the heating. So here's, a, here's the heating unit. It pumps in and out. There's a separate pump unit. You do a separate one if you need to cool. You use alcohol and ice, and it can get as cold as you need. And again, there's a, regula uh, a regulator that notices the temperature, but it can all happen away from the reaction. So this is a very well-controlled environment. Um, and then there's uh, another input for the reagents to be injected from the uh, syringe pumps. Anybody who wants to see this, I have more parts and I can show you how everything goes together. Now, what's the hard part? The hard part, of course, is the chemistry. How do you do the chemistry? You know, it takes many steps. How do you deal with purity and yield at each step? How do you make sure that you're filtering properly? The trick for this is that you do the work beforehand. You simplify the chemistry before you do it. Now, how do you do that? Well, we do this with our friends, the computers. This molecule here, and here, and here, is Daraprim. That's the Martin Shkreli drug, the one that was so expensive that I manufactured. The traditional manufacturing process is here in this slide. As you can see, it's uh, three steps and requires uh, I won't get into the technical aspect. Anybody who wants curious about the chemistry, I can describe it. But it's a difficult reaction. So we went to a company called Chematica. They operate out of Poland. And they have a very sophisticated machine learning algorithm that will read through the last 500 or so years of chemical literature and look for reactions that are related to the one that you're trying to do. And it'll look and give good guesses as to easier ways to do things. They're very famous for being able to do what's called a one-pot shot reaction. 
And I said, I want a one-step reaction so I can manufacture Daraprim. They said, OK, here it is. Now, what you see here, and I'll show you in the next slide, this is the, uh, the, the, um, the search map from the machine learning algorithm that I actually pulled together to do that reaction. That reaction, it's not um, <clears throat> viable if you're making medicine. This is what's called the Suzuki reaction, which uses a palladium catalyst. Palladium is a heavy metal. It's very hard to filter, very toxic if you take it. So that kind of wasn't in the cards. So I went back to them. I said, OK, look, <laughs> great work. Thank you. But uh, I need something that we can take internally. And I said, OK, how about this one? This is two steps. This is a Grignard reaction. This is a condensation reaction. All fairly simple things that you can do at home without complicated materials. And there are the margin of error is much higher. So the possibility of screwing up by varying the temperature or varying the amount of time that you take or measuring poorly, it's just, it's just extra. You're just wasting it. It doesn't create anything new. So again, here looking at the machine, oh, oh, sorry, looking at the, the machine learning algorithm, this is a screenshot from the, the software that they use that managed to develop this. And as you can see, this was a pretty sophisticated search that they ran on some big supercomputer somewhere, I, I think. It's all proprietary. They wouldn't tell me. <laughs> Interesting thing, in addition to it being proprietary, it's very expensive. They want $30,000 for each time that they do this. Now, I did not pay them $30,000 for this. I was like, hey, can we see if it actually works? <laughs> and they gave me this one. And I said, listen, I got four more if this works, assuming I get funding. <clears throat> Funding hasn't come through. If you know any rich people, please introduce me. That said, they also are no longer really in business. They got bought. Um, and it was by Merck or some really big company. I don't remember who. Um, but the interesting thing was is that this technology is under patent. And the original idea of patent, even though it doesn't work very well anymore, is that you should be able to read somebody's patent and reproduce their results. So what do you need for a machine learning mechanism? You need a little machine, and you need a lot of data. So <laughs> looking at this, this is a graph of their data from their original paper. And as you can see, they use the Reaxis database, which has about 6 million reactions. I have a data scientist on my team, and I said, hey, can we do this? And she said, yeah, sure. And we found NIST, which is a public database. It only has 1,000 reactions. But as you can see, the structure is the same. And we recently found another public database that's even more robust, where an automated bot went and scraped um, chemical data from every US patent and managed to package it very well. So, that's not going to be millions of reactions, but it's going to be hundreds of thousands. And so we'll have a, a better database. And we've made a partnership with some people at MIT and Stanford who do have access to Reaxis, and maybe we can use it. So again, point is, science works. You can go do it. And nobody can tell you you can't. I mean, people can tell you you can't, but they can't stop you, per se. <laughs> um, and, I th and, and that's the thing that's dearest to my heart, is thinking about the fact that s being able to pursue science is a human right. Can we look at data? Can we collect it? Can we think about it? Can we analyze it? Can we come up with theories? Yeah. And how cool and how lucky we all are to be able to do that. <clears throat> so um, I, I'm, I go till 15 after, yeah? Is that correct? I just want to make sure my time is correct. Yeah? OK. So I have a minute. So on a personal note, this is a photograph from my driver's license from not very long ago. As you can see, my hair is different. <clears throat> this wasn't a stylistic choice. This wasn't out of fashion. Um, <laughs> this. Uh, this was me in El Salvador. I was in, uh, I was in Costa Rica later, and I caught MRSA, which if you don't know, is one of the super bugs. It's a bacterial infection that's resistant to most antibiotics. 
The list of antibiotics that humanity has is about a page long. There are <clears throat> four that MRSA responds to. MRSA stands for methicillin resistant staph aureus. So it's, it's a staph infection. It went septic. I nearly died. I was, uh, so there, there are four, yeah, there are four or five classes of antibiotic to which it actually re reacts. <clears throat> Turns out I'm allergic to three of those. I was on a double dose of doxycycline for a month, and it nearly killed me because antibiotics are really toxic. They destroy your kidneys, they destroy your liver, and I was really close to dying. But in Costa Rica, I had a really nice doctor. He took very good care of me. I went and I saw him every day, and he treated me with a bunch of different things, and eventually I got better. I was okay. I flew to see my parents in, uh, in Oregon, in the Estados Unidos, and I was okay for six weeks, and all my symptoms came back. Now, in Oregon, I wasn't in the woods, okay? I was in Eugene. Eugene is a town where the University of Oregon is. It's a big university town. There's a big hospital culture, and it's very wealthy, and I couldn't get treated. Doctors would not see me. Urgent care gave me um, Vicodin, which is a, like, pain, like a painkiller and, and Tylenol. Um, I actually was extraordinarily rude to the nurse who did that. I'm not proud of it, but I was really, really angry because I said, look, here's my paperwork. I went to a lab. I know this is what's in my system. I know this is the only thing to which it will react. They sent me away. They sent me away. I eventually bought doxycycline on the black market. I went and saw a doctor that was a friend of a friend. I got better. But it's very weird to think about not being able to get medical care in the richest nation in the world in a hospital town. And, and I went to see infectious disease. I went to an infectious disease ward, a specialty ward. And I said, I need some treatment. And they said, you don't have a reference, go away. And I said, I have cash. I will pay you cash. And they said, we don't care, go away. And yet, in Costa Rica, it wasn't a problem. I had this wonderful doctor, he saw me every day. It was great, and I got better. <clears throat> Very strange. So, to get back to what we're doing, we're very proud of all the work we're doing. We're very happy about trying to bring medications to people who don't have it. But that's not the big deal. This is a small, small piece of a much bigger picture where we'd like to see knowledge, specifically curated knowledge, not just information, but understanding being more widespread so that people have access. And not to get too like ranty political, but the structure of this is thus, oppression comes from resource control. Resource control comes from information control. And information control comes from the commodification of information, and that's only possible if the conceptual basis for the understanding of that information is shrouded in some way. And this happens all the time, all over the world. And we see this, it's not just an institutional problem, it's a cultural problem. We see somebody who has a great memory and we think they're smart. We see somebody on a quiz show, we think they're smart. We see somebody who can calculate numbers very quickly, we think they're smart. Doesn't mean that they're thinking critically. I'm sorry. It doesn't mean they're thinking critically. It doesn't mean that they are um, analyzing information well. It doesn't mean they have an understanding of structure. If we can re-gear our education systems so that instead of teaching children what to think, we can teach them how to think, we can break out of this cycle. And um, I like this slide, this is not mine, and you'll forgive the very sexist phraseology here. Um, but the point, I think, is well taken. You can give somebody information, and it's useful. And that is helpful. And we thank everybody like Sci-Hub and WikiLeaks and all of, the all of the information distribution channels that work so hard to make information uh, free. 
uh, and uh, liberated. Um, but what is much more powerful is instead of taking a commodity and redistributing it, what we can do is we can start to create a well from which information can be created so that all people can mine their own information, create it, because the understanding exists. So uh, this is my penultimate slide. And I don't know if you, uh, some of you I'm sure know this picture, but Carl Sagan made this very famous. And, and it always makes me a little emotional, but there we are. And help is not on the way. So, it's up to us. Thank you all so much. <laughs> so I'll, um, I, I think I have maybe five minutes still. I have 10 minutes. OK, so I'm, I'm happy to chat a little more. I didn't get water, so my throat's a little dry. But I'll, probably, I'll happily take questions in English, Spanish, German, um, or, or I don't know. A a any Western European language, I think, is OK. <laughs> uh, or or we, can just, uh, we can just hang out. That's cool, too. Sir. I'm sorry, I also don't hear very well because the MERS infection started in my ear. So I'm just going to come over here. Yes? Uh, where do you want to take this next? You mentioned that you're looking for funding. What would you like to do with this moving forward? Yeah, so the, the goal ultimately, um, we're hoping by the first of the year, and again, here's, here's sort of the parts that I was able to you know, get past TSA. Um, oh. Thank you so much. Um, um, and I'll happily show pictures of other, but we're trying to get to a beta stage um, by the first of the year and release it. And hopefully, if we can, um, and also generate some, um, so the package you'll download will be, uh, here are all the parts that you need. Here are the places that you can purchase them as cheaply as we know. Um, here's how to assemble them. Then here's the code that you put into the microcomputer. And then here is the file that will do the manufacturing of a particular drug. Uh, hopefully one of the three or four that I showed you. Um, and then here is where you purchase the chemical precursors. And then you can, you can run it. The goal being, again, when you say next step, is that it it grows in the open source community. Um, I would ca couch success as being the moment when somebody said, hey, I used your machine and I figured out a better way. I figured out something new to do with it. I figured out a way to manufacture something you, you weren't thinking about. And hopefully that this becomes um, a, a tool of inquiry so the citizen science can move into the chemical realm, which it hasn't thus far. If you look at underground chemistry, it's mostly people who are trying to manufacture narcotics or explosives. Uh, and, and I tried talking with them. They're very good at those two things and not much else. Um, so, um, so again, we're, we're hoping to try and get a, get a beta release. We're also hoping to release the new um, open version of the Chematica software so that people can do reaction searches to try to figure out more efficient ways of manufacturing um, new things. So um, there's still a lot of work to do. And, and yeah, funding would be nice. If, if any of you have loose Bitcoin, you, you can dump it at our, our website. Please, we'll, we'll take it. Um, and yeah, uh, two years ago, when we, when we stopped being an underground organization, um, I, I presented at Hope. And people gave me some Bitcoin. It was worth a few hundred dollars then. And um, now it's worth a few thousand. And it was why I was able to actually come here. Is we, we, had the, we had the Bitcoin money. So those are some of the things that we're trying to do next. So thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, one, two, three. So yes, sir. Uh, two things. Uh, first, 
how feasible it, it, it is to scale this to the scale of a small hospital? Mm. And second, what about quality control? Is it would it be feasible to have some chromatography uh, by open hardware? Because I guess for scaling this to, to in a small hospital in some country, you you have to do some some testing for the quality. Right. So okay. So. <clears throat> Um, right. Uh, yeah, I should, I should address the legal issue. Uh, and I'm sorry I kind of glazed over that. Um, we have a tiny bit of political immunity uh, or um, legal, legal and political immunity because we only distribute information. We don't sell kits. Um, we don't even track downloads or website visits because we don't encourage use of the software or the hardware. We say, we've created this. If you think it's a good idea, that's kind of your business. Um, we're not connected to that. So um, we've, we don't spend any energy thinking about like how do we make this legal, how do we move this into the mainstream. That may occur downstream with another organization somewhere, I'm sure. But again, that's a much more difficult process that's on that, that liberal end of the spectrum. That's, that's the long the long seeing, the hard work, the, the, the slow, the more important work, the permanent work. Um, but we don't, we don't do that. We're just trying to start. We're just trying to get things started. And in terms of scalability, unfortunately, not much of this scales. This is, this is small scale. It's, it's not for, you might be able to serve maybe a small community. So if you had a very small community and you had one person who had one, they might be able to manufacture medications on demand. This whole thing started when I was in El Salvador and I was in a tiny little village and the nurse told me that they didn't have any birth control. And I said, you know, it's an ecstasy lab down the street. This is ridiculous. I can make that. Like, it's not hard. Um, and so, and so the, you know, the idea is, is merely a stopgap. So how do you, how do you, how do you serve a, a, you know? And also chemistry changes drastically when you scale. It's, it's not the same at all. If you ever meet somebody who's a chemical engineer, just ask them about how to mix things. And they'll talk to you for hours. Because in something this big, like, there, I mixed it. Done. If you have a giant drum, even, even 1,000 gallons, not even 50,000 gallons, just 1,000, or even 500. Mixing is not easy, and it doesn't work well. So chemistry doesn't scale, but the old school, you know, you know 16th century, you know, wet chemistry lab, or, or 1900s, um, is much simpler. That's one of the things that allows this to work more easily. So, yeah? Um, yes? Yeah, my question. Yeah, we were in the 95 range. So, I mean, yeah, and, <clears throat> but again, um, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was, um, it was an un, unreacted precursor, so fairly inert. And, and we knew that going in. And again, that's, that's the thing that we worked so hard with on the retrosynthesis side beforehand, because the goal is can you set up can you set it up so that somebody who doesn't have GCMS or NMR can still, you know, manufacture something with a fair degree of certainty that they made what they think they made? Oh, I, I also have a, a, for those of you who like prototyping, I have a wireframe of the user interface. So if you want to see that work, I have that as well. And I'll happily show anybody who's interested. Um, one more, here, and then, there, so one, two, three, yeah. Can you tell us something about the, the community where you are in? How it works, the sound, mm. uh, how we can help? So we're an anarchist collective. Um, some, of, some of the members I know personally. Some of them I don't even know their real names or where they live. We, uh, we use Semaphore, which is like Slack, except it's end-to-end -end encrypted. There are people all over the world. I know we have. Some people on the east coast of the United States, some people on the west coast of the United States. Um, we have a number of uh, people in the Netherlands and the UK. Um, uh, I have at least one doctor from Iran. Um, 
and a few other places. And again, some people, I don't know, a couple people from Hong Kong as well. Um, and so it's, 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 uh, it's, again, that sort of trade-off of, of uh, lack of, lack of infrastructure. Given that we're an anarchist collective, everybody does their work only out of volunteer love, but work is slow. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was one. Uh, yeah, one there, and then yeah. Um, maybe I missed this, but is there a related work in the sense that other people are trying to do this? Because actually, it sounds like even if you're not political, like really great fun if you're a fantasy guy. It's like a thing to do, probably, right? Yeah. So we're not the we're not the first people to try and do this sort of thing, and there are other people who are doing similar work. <clears throat> the the places, so, so interesting groups to look up. There's a group at MIT that's developed a, a, a really cool sort of set of machines. It's about refrigerator size, and it's complete throughput. Like, you get pills at the end. Like, like you actually, like, pills. And it, and it can run continuously. But, and the quality control is very strict. It's, it's a much more exact machine. It's much more expensive. It's also run the, the test sphere of uh, the FDA. Um, the problem is it can only do one medication. So they have to custom make you a machine to manufacture one drug. While this is sort of a general purpose reactor. Again, more throughput, more accuracy, more cost, and specificity. So there, there, and, and there's one other group um, in a different branch of MIT that's trying to do a general organic uh, chemistry reactor saying here's a sort of library of basic reagents and then on demand I want some weird precursor before I go to my lab I don't want to have to order it from Sigma Aldrich I'm just going to ask for it again very complicated machine um, more accuracy more money you can't build it yourself and there's only one of them Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's so weird. Now, there was one guy who said, um, a very, very innovative, very thoughtful guy. He gave a TED talk that you should look up on specifically doing this, where he said, 3D printing was this major thing, but I'm a chemist. I wanted to do chemistry. And I said, everything in organic chemistry is carbon, you know, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. I should be able to take those four things and build anything I want. And he had this beautiful vision of a system that would 3D print a custom reaction chamber, inject the things in just such a way, and be able to react whatever the precursor they needed for the next stage was, and then repeat the process. Beautiful vision. This happened four years ago. He's done nothing with it. It was a great idea, and it was a great TED talk, but he didn't, he didn't finish. He didn't even really start. I think he did one project where they like, you know, they managed to couple hydrogen with something, but it was very, very minimal. It was sort of a proof of concept, and it didn't even really prove the concept. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And, and, and at one point when I was starting this project, a friend of mine said, what if, what if somebody does this, you know, and finishes it before you do? I was like, awesome. <laughs> Great. Because <laughs> I'm not a chemist or, you know, or, or a systems engineer, or, you know, a, a manufacturer, or a computer scientist, like, all of these things that I did on that alpha unit, I did them very badly. You know, now, now I work with people who are expert in these different fields. And if any of you are interested and are expert in any of these fields, please come talk to me, because we can always use more help. Yeah. Uh, one more? Okay. All right. Well, I think my time is up. Thank you all so much.